We are more than 550 days into Russia's war in Ukraine. The U.S. has spent more than $70 billion to support Ukraine. And as Americans grow fatigued with the headlines on the war, Vladimir Putin is plotting his next move and meeting with Kim Jong-un to discuss a possibility of getting even more weapons. I want to bring in an absolute expert on this subject, Dmitry Alperovich. He is an expert in all things Russia and Ukraine. He was there over the summer. He'll be returning in just a few weeks. He's the founder of Silverado Policy Accelerator, a D.C.-based geopolitical geopolit think tank. Dimitri, you and I spent some time this summer, and you explained this war to me. We were on a hike, and I said, if we survived this hike, which we barely did, I wanted you to come on this show and explain it to our, our audience. So I want to start with, remind our audience, we're a year and a half in. Why did Vladimir Putin start this war? Why does he believe he deserves Ukraine? Well, to understand that, Stephanie, you have to understand Vladimir Putin. And most people assume that he is, you know, the first line of his biography is always he's a KGB agent. And of course he is that, but that was 30 plus years ago. What he is more is a gangster because in the 1990s, he was deputy mayor of St. Petersburg. At the time, St. Petersburg, the second largest city in Russia, was ruled by organized crime. And what a deputy mayor... Putin, was, what was he in charge of? He was in charge of casino licenses. He was in charge of export licenses in the ports, business regulations, all the things that would bring him into close proximity with organized crime. And you can see that as he be, later became president, sometimes he lets his inner gangster slip through. For example, when he invaded Chechnya in 1999, he said, we're going to kill them in the outhouse. You know, that's not the talk of an intelligence officer, even a KGB officer. It's not a talk of a president. That's the talk of a gangster. Uh, just most recently, right before the invasion of Ukraine, when he was meeting with Macron, he said that Ukraine, he, he was qu quoting a, a song that's basically a ra rape song, gangster rape song. He says Ukraine has to take it. It's her duty. So that is who he is. And when he looked at Ukraine, he essentially assumed that Ukraine is his. Ukraine is, has to belong to Russia in his mind. He doesn't accept that, that it's an independent country. What, what does a gangster do when he sees his girlfriend go out in the town and flirt with another perhaps bigger uh, person that, that you can't take on? You're going to take it out on the girl. Right? And it's not about NATO expansion. It's not about Ukraine's ambitions to join the European Union. It's about all of that. It's about a much more elemental desire to control Ukraine because you believe it's hit, it's yours uh, in Vladimir Putin's mind. And now that he realizes he can't possibly have it, what is he going to do? He's going to destroy it so that if I can't have it, no one else can have it. And what could Kim Jong-un do to help him? How concerned should we be? Well, it's a big problem because the one constraint that Russia has, and frankly Ukraine as well, is ammunition, particularly artillery ammunition. The 152 millimeter ammunition, that Soviet era ammunition that Russia is using, that Ukraine has used before they moved to Western weapons, um, they're expanding huge amounts of it, tens of thousands of shells every single month. And they're running out. They're trying to ramp up production, but they can't keep up. We can't keep up with it either. So everyone's going around the world trying to procure ammunition. We went to South Korea and procured a million shells that are basically enabling this offensive for Ukraine. Vladimir Putin is trying to do the same thing, and he is trying to procure it from Kim Jong-un. Some Americans here and some lawmakers are growing fatigued. They're saying, that's a problem. He may be a gangster, but that's not our problem. Remind our audience why the $70 billion and counting matters and why we need to continue the support. I think most people at this point assume that the threat to Ukraine is over, that Vladimir Putin has grabbed what he could, and now it's a question of how much territory can Ukraine get. People do think that, but what yeah. is it like there? But, but actually, the reality is that Vladimir Putin has not abandoned his ambitions to still own Ukraine. I think he's very likely to try another offensive this, uh, later this winter, maybe in the spring, and try to grab more territory, perhaps even go against Kiev. So the idea that this war is just about which village Ukraine can take back and how much territory they can restore uh, back to their sovereignty um, is really uh, a pipe dream, because Vladimir Putin wants to continue this war. He has not abandoned his ambitions to, uh, uh, ambitions to dominate Ukraine. So you think things are worse than ever there, right? People think it was two years ago when you saw schools and churches bombed out. They somehow think, oh, people are kind of getting back to normal. That's not the case. 
Absolutely not. Well, certainly it's been bad over the last 18 months, so I don't want to diminish that. But the reality is that you have an infrastructure, an electric grid that's hanging on by a thread. Last year... Heading it, into winter. Heading into winter. Last year, it almost fell apart under these massive strikes that the uh, Russians have been launching against Ukraine, these missile strikes. And they can do this again this winter. And it's a real question of whether Ukrainian infrastructure can sustain another assault like this. When do you think this war will end? And how do you think it will end? Well, in one sense, this war has been going on since 2014, for nine years. Most people forget about this, that, that, that these days, but it's not a war that just started in 2022. And unfortunately, I hate to say this, but it can go on for another nine years. And the reality is that while Vladimir Putin is alive, it's likely to continue, and may even continue after he's dead, depending on who replaces him. So you, th you don't see an end in sight? I don't think one is likely. And Vladimir uh, Zelensky, Vladimir Zelensky, just said this weekend that he's now preparing his country for a long war. Is there anything that could end it? Well, Vladimir Putin could give up. He could die tomorrow and be replaced by, you know, a Democrat, uh, perhaps someone like uh, Navalny that uh, could take over and end the war. But, but what's I think the that's likelihood that that will happen? Almost zero. I mean, he could die eventually, but I'm not sure that he would be so replaced by So your prognosis, by this thing could last eight, nine, ten years, even after Vladimir Putin dies, and he is not losing strength, losing motivation whatsoever. I think it's very likely to last years. That's a tough outlook. It's very tough for Ukraine.